Thank you for that kind introduction. Jeff and I know each other for maybe seven, eight years now since he was a medical student. We worked on some projects together. And I dare say that actually we're, we're friends now. Is that right, Jeff? Are you fair? Is that fair to say? I think it's fair. I think it's fair to say. Okay, all right. So we can disclose the, disclose the truth. So thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk to you about how to keep up with medical information. Um, hopefully we get into some interesting things. Jeff said uh, it was carte blanche to present you controversial stuff. So we're going to have some of that in there too. Um, but hopefully you have some tips on how to keep up with reading the literature. All right. So this all starts with a case. This is, um, this is a real case. This is really what happens in real life. I was uh, in clinic once and I was with my patient. My patient's a 65-year-old woman and she has multiple myeloma. And she comes to the clinic visits with her sister who's younger, who's 60 years old, younger sister. The sister ha is totally fine, no multiple myeloma. And so often is the case, it's the family member that asks you the really hard question, as was this case. She said to me, doctor, you know, do you think I should increase the amount of exercise I do to avoid getting multiple myeloma? After all, my sister has it. I would hate to get multiple myeloma. Maybe it runs in the family. I don't know. But do you think exercise might keep it at bay? And I was trying to rack my brain to know, see if I knew any statistics on exercise and myeloma. But then she fired off the doozy. Didn't you read the new study, doctor? Oh, the new study, right, the new study. Yes, of course, I'm the type of doctor that keeps up with the literature. I should be reading the new study. And the new study she was talking about was this. She had read about it on the American Cancer Society. It says, getting enough exercise lowers the risk of seven cancers. And uh, it was based on this JCO paper, the amount and intensity of leisure time physical activity and lower cancer risk. And it was data from nine prospective cohorts which pooled 750,000 people. Let me see if I can get my mouse over there. 700,000 people, and they looked at 15 different cancers. And they found that for seven of the 15, there was a statistically significant lower risk of cancer. So these are healthy people, prospective cohorts. They follow them for decades. They wrote down how much they exercised, and they followed them out into the future to see if they developed cancer. They looked at 15 cancers, and seven of the 15 there was a relationship. And the first question I thought of was, why these 15 cancers? And as an oncologist, I said, you know, how many cancers are there? And I actually realized I did not know the answer because in the most recent WHO, there's at least 200 lymphomas, and there's probably thousands of cancers, and every year they keep slicing and dicing them until there's more cancers. So they're looking at 15. Why these 15? We'll get into it. And the patient's sister was right. Did it die? I think it died. No? Yeah, but I can. Maybe need new batteries. There. Oh. Yeah, you can just uh, turn that one on and then use that one. Uh oh. All right, I'll just use this. Okay. So she was right. Actually, this is multiple myeloma, which is the cancer she's worried about. These are healthy people. This is the risk of developing incident myeloma. It's the hazard ratio. One means there's actually no protective effect at all. And if it goes low, that means there's a protective effect. And uh, as you can see, based on these uh, metabolic equivalents per month, when you get up to 15, you get into the, uh, the benefit zone. You have a protective relationship between exercise and multiple myeloma. When you get to 22 or 30 hours a week, you know, too much of a good thing doesn't work anymore. You know, you see that, right? It's clear there's a sweet spot. So when I saw this paper, I did what any self-respecting doctor would do, which is I admitted myself. I admitted to myself I had no idea what a MET was. I'm an oncologist. What do I know what a MET is? I know what a PET is, but not PET is my physical exam. A MET, I don't know. I don't know what a MET is. Um, so I did the honorable thing. I tilted my monitor away from the patient, and I looked it up on Wikipedia. And on Wikipedia, actually, it's a really nice table, really nice table. Light intensity, moderate intensity, vigorous intensity. These are the number of METs you earn when you do the activity. And uh, there's three different thresholds of activity. Back in those days in Oregon, Jeff knows, I was a cyclist. Uh, I was riding to work, uh, you know, six, seven miles each way. And so I was, I was through the roof in Mets, probably. I was off the chart, back in the danger zone of myeloma. I noticed that sexual activity was on the list, but it was benchmarked for a 22-year-old. And as an old person, I found that deeply insulting. So <laughs> I found that insulting. I went to the supplement appendix. You know, I really want to get to the bottom of this paper. And in the supplement, I found out that the true story is even more complicated. Now that I knew what a MET was, 
I realized that the protective effect was pretty much only there for moderate intensity exercise, but not vigorous intensity exercise. So there you have it. How did I feel? You looked at 15 cancers, and I don't know how many cancers there are, thousands of cancers. For seven of them, there was a beneficial relationship. You're looking at METs, the relationship's only true for moderate, not vigorous intensity. How did I feel about this research? I felt like this. I have stock photos of myself in all emotional states. It's actually true, but uh, I felt confused. I felt confused. And why was I confused? Because it's implausible in my mind. I'm the biggest believer, and I know Jeff is too, we're the biggest believers that exercise is good for you. That's why we do it. But am I really gonna believe that 15 mets protects against myeloma, but you do more, you're not protected anymore? Am I really to believe it's only moderate intensity, not vigorous intensity? And then what about the potential for multiple hypothesis testing? There are 15 cancers they're reporting, but how many do they look at? They look at 40 cancers, they're picking the 15, of which half have a relationship, half don't. Did they look at 50 cancers, 60 cancers? And what about exercise? They're presenting it as METs per week, but you could also present it as hours running or how many miles you biked. There are many ways you can slice and dice exercise. Why this way? So if you start to think about all the ways you could have analyzed the data, it's probably thousands or 10,000 ways to analyze the data. They're just showing me seven slices that are significant. Then there's confounding. You know, imagine I have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. I might be both less likely to exercise and more likely to develop multiple myeloma. Maybe that's true, especially with the way people send SPEPs around here. You never know. I might be more likely to develop, right? And then finally, there's measurement error. This is all based on self-reported exercise. And as we all know, that sometimes self-reports can be incorrect. So how did I answer the patient? I did what any great doctor does. I didn't answer the question directly, and I redirected to a question I knew the answer to. So I said, look, if you're asking me, do I believe staying healthy is, uh, staying active is part of leading a healthy life? My answer to you is yes, of course. If you're asking me, would I specifically do it to avoid multiple myeloma? My answer to you is I would do it as part of a broader pattern of general and cardiovascular health. And to this, she uh, fired back the doozy. Have you read the paper, doctor, the new paper? Did you read it? And the answer to that question, of course, of course the answer was, was no, I hadn't read the paper. No, of course not. I can't read all the papers, and neither can you. And this paper's too boring, frankly. I wouldn't have read it. It wouldn't have caught my interest. It's too boring, and there's too many papers, and none of us can read all the papers. And so that's what this talk is about, how you will someday not be embarrassed, as I was with this patient sister, when I admitted I hadn't read the paper. And I had no idea what a MET was. All right, so the objectives of this, I think, are to talk to you about the best techniques to keep up with the literature, some examples of studies or topics where I think the literature is commonly misinterpreted, I've pulled out my typical topic and I've inserted a very controversial one for number topic number two. So, you know, you can see what you think of it. And then finally, how can you be a better reader of medical information? There are 50 million scientific articles indexed in PubMed. That's so much that we never need another insomnia drug. You've got all the insomnia medication right there. 50 million articles and they're coming out at a pace. This is 10 years old. 10 years ago, they're coming out at 2 million per year. 2 million new articles per year, it's unbelievable. If your field is just kidney cancer, you can't even read all the, kidney, the clinical trials in kidney cancer. Not even right kidney cancer and left kidney cancer. You can't even, I don't know, just in the right kidney. You know, you can't keep up with it, it's too much. So you need some tool where you decide what you're gonna read. At the same time, I, hear, I see headlines like this all the time. There's replication, duplication, and waste in a quarter million systematic reviews and meta-analyses. The mass production of redundant, misleading, and conflicted systematic reviews and meta-analyses and challenges in irreproducible research. So we got so many articles that no human being can possibly read them and most are bad. Most are bad. That's what they're telling you. So how are we to navigate this field? And I think we'll all have to, especially in academics, especially in private practice, we'll all have to navigate because we all have to find some way to keep up with the literature. And so if you decide to go to sleep, the rest of this talk all is in this article I wrote many years ago called The 21st Century Physician, How Do You Triage the Tsunami of Medical Information? But I'm gonna walk you through. This is a non-evidence-based way that I recommend people triage. All right, timing is everything. So I always tell people, just pick one journal to keep up with. That's a good way to start, okay? And the one thing you need to know 
is when that journal is putting out its content. Because timing is everything. Because you want to look at the articles right when they come out. And I'll tell you why in a second. So I know on Monday, 10.30 Pacific time, you know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be on JAM Internal Medicine website. <laughs> the hot new articles just dropped, and I want to be the first to read them. At least know the titles so that nobody can surprise me and say, hey, did you see that article in JAM IM? I'll say, yeah, I saw it. Actually, it's some herbal mixture from, I think, China has a, has a survival benefit. You know, I saw something in I was like, whoa, what's this? I'm going to take I have to read that later. I've got to read that later. <laughs> on Tuesday, of course, it's the big day. It's Mama Jamma. Mama Jamma comes out <laughs> Tuesday, 10.30. And you know me. If I'm at the elevator, I'm looking at my phone, 10.30, I'm like, oh boy, I better check out. Boom. I look at the new articles. What's out? Wednesday, of course, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, the big momentous hour. Any JM just dropped those articles. Jay just fell, and you want to look through really quickly, see what people are going to be talking about. You want to know. And for me, I actually keep up with a couple oncology journals, and, uh, and then I also read the the lay media, you know, I browse that in the morning when I'm waking up. All right, so we all have our habit. I recommend just start with one, just pick one journal. Probably New England Journal makes most sense for people in this room. And when the articles come out, you want to just look at it. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. You want to look at it and you want to skim the titles. You want to see what applies to your practice. What should you read? And probably, I always tell people, you only really need to read about one article a month. But the tough part is you probably need to look at 100 articles a month to know what you're not gonna read. How do I decide what to read? I'm much more likely to read something that's about my practice rather than another field. So on college, I'm gonna read rheumatology. I had to let it go, I'm sorry, I can't keep up. I know they got all these new drugs. I don't know what they're doing with arthritis anymore. I forgot it all. Um, I'm more likely to read randomized than observational. I'm more likely to read multi-center than single center. I have a sample size cutoff in my mind. If it's less than 200, I don't even read it. If it's over 200, it might make my list. And I also want to read something that people are talking about and I think is interesting. So that's how I pick my article to read. But the reason I want to look at the articles right when they come out is because people are going to be talking about it right here. <laughs> my, uh, my sources tell me that in the before times, we would gather around this relic, which was <laughs> called a water cooler, and uh, we would talk about what we were reading. Those days are over. They're dead. No one gathers around water coolers anymore. Although here, actually, you guys have a good room. So maybe you all do, but we don't do it at UCSF. People live on Zoom. I think I haven't seen people in years. Uh, instead, they gather here in the hellscape called Twitter. Yeah, they're on Twitter, but that's where they're going to be talking about the new articles. And what I think is the purpose of knowing the articles came out, it's really helpful to you because you can go on there and there's always going to be a few people with something clever to say about the new article. If it's cardiology, for instance, John Mandrola, electrophysiologist from Kentucky, or Venk Morthy from University of Michigan. He's going to have something clever to say about the article. And so you want to know the article came out. Maybe you skim the abstract. Then you see what this clever person says. And then you go back and you're like, maybe it catches your interest. You might want to read that for the month. Maybe not. You know? But being a part of the conversation, I think, is the easiest way to keep up with the literature. If you don't, I think you'll never keep up. I always tell this anecdote that when I was a resident, I printed every article I wanted to read for the course of my residency. And I stapled it and I put it on my nightstand. And my goal was when I went on vacation, I was going to take all those articles and I was going to read them and, and learn. And what happened was when I moved out of that apartment, I blew the dust off a big stack of articles and I deposited them straight in the recycling bin. <laughs> and I think that's the reality. You know, if you don't have a little way to keep up all the time, you're just never going to read anything. And so I think my method is the way to avoid that is to keep up with the articles. All right, so I'm going to give you two. Two articles where, or I'm going to give you two, one topic, one article that caught my eye. So you all know this drug, Entresto. I'm sure it's prescribed more commonly these days. I see the sales statistics from Novartis. It's up and up and up. It's Secubitril Valsartan. And I remember the fateful Wednesday in 2014 when the article dropped. I was in oncology fellowship, but I hadn't forgotten my, my met internal medicine root roots. I still remembered something about cardiology. Now I've forgotten it entirely, but back then I remembered. And I saw this article came out and said, angiotensin neprilysin inhibition versus enalapril in heart failure. And it was a randomized trial of 8,000 people, and it was hailed as a positive study. And, you know, we hadn't had a positive new drug in heart failure in 20 years. Now you all have a flows in this and flows in that, you know. But back then, we had nothing. We had ACE inhibitors. We had the ICD. Now these days, that's called into question. We had a beta blocker. We debated endlessly 
How much beta blocker to give? What's the dose of beta blocker? That's what we used to talk about. So I saw this came out and I thought it got, piqued my interest. This was the, this was the main finding. All-cause mortality. This is the most important endpoint people care about. And there's an old saying in oncology, which is if you can fit the laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary session at the national meeting. <laughs> Here, you can fit at least four or five laser pointers. So as an oncologist, this blew our mind. This was amazing. LCZ696, it sounds like a license plate, but it is the drug. It defeated an allopril, resoundingly. The p-value's got so many zeros in it, that must mean it's good. The hazard ratio is beneficial. This is why we prescribe the drug, this one study. This is in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, mostly New York heart two and three, a couple people with four, and a couple people with one who slipped in there. So, I saw this paper, it caught my eye. I knew this was gonna be my paper of the month I'm gonna read. Um, how do I read the paper? I think the mistake we make is when you have your printed paper to read it cover to cover. Because I think that's gonna put you to sleep. So what I do is I ask questions in my mind and I look for the answer. So I have a question in my mind and I go hunt for the answer and then I come back, next question, go hunt for the answer. I always ask just these simple questions. What was the intervention? What did they do in the study? Is the control arm what you would have done in your practice? Because a trial can only change your practice if the control arm is your practice. What was the effect size? Small, medium, large. I already told you, you could fit five laser pointers in that. That's really good by our counts. Clinical or surrogate endpoint. Clinical endpoint is something that intrinsically matters to patients, how you feel or function. And a surrogate endpoint is a stand-in endpoint. It's your LDL cholesterol, your A1C. It's uh, something that's a marker for what counts. As a friend of mine says, it's an endpoint the patient didn't know was important until the doctor said it was. You know, so that's what a surrogate is. What happened after the trial ended? Any games with patient selection? We'll take a look at these questions. So what did they do in this study? They took Valsartan, 160 milligrams BID. This is a drug I'm very familiar with. It's an angiotensin receptor blocker. It was used even back in the diggity in heart failure. We used it a lot. But what I wasn't familiar with was 160 milligrams BID. I got dizzy just looking at that dose because that's a stiff dose. And I think if you gave me that dose right now, you'd have to call a code because I don't think I could take it. I don't think many people can take that dose. I think it's a, that's a fainting level dose. That's the only dose that's ever been studied. Actually, we'll come back to that. And it's paired with a new drug, Secubitril, which is a neprilysin inhibitor. I've never heard of that in my life. I never heard of neprilysin. I never heard of the inhibition of neprilysin. And since this came out, I don't see any other neprilysin inhibitors. I see dapagliflozin and pagliflozin, this flows and that flows in. I don't see any bitrils. I only see one bitril. There's no other bitrils. It's very interesting. They pair this. And so I always ask medical students when I give this talk, I always say something like, look, you're designing a randomized trial. This is our intervention. What do you want the control arm to be? And they always say this. They always say, we want 10,000 people. You know, let's make a nice heart failure study. We're gonna randomize them to Secubitril Valsartan versus Valsartan. That just makes a lot of sense. The only moving part is the new drug. We get a clean effect for what does the Secubitril do? After all, Valsartan is off patent. Secubitril is the reason why Novartis gets to charge a lot for this drug. It's the on patent medication. So this is what they suggest. And I say, you know what? I would have done that too. But, and I would have just take ACE intolerant people for trial one. They didn't do that. They did this. Secubitril 160 BID against enalapril 10 milligrams BID. So I ask myself, is the control arm what you would do for your patient? I say, I have actually no patients on enalapril 10 milligrams BID. Because it's a twice daily drug. You know, we have lisinopril. Why wouldn't you, you make it easier for the patient? And also that dose caught my eye too, 10. <clears throat> Wait a second, I checked the package leaflet. 160 BID is the maximally approved angiotensin receptor blocker dose. 10 milligrams BID is the half max dose for enalapril and heart failure. So now I'm starting to feel like this is a little weird. You got new drug versus old drug at max dose versus old, different old drug at submaximal dosing. And we're trying to isolate the effect of the new drug, Secubitril. That's what this trial is about, trying to get this product on the market. Now we got two moving parts. Different control arm and different dosing. I also knew the last author of this study, Milt Packer, had already published data on circulation a few years before showing that the dose of the ACE mattered, that the higher the dose, the better people did. And that's why in cardiology clinic, they'd always try to ramp these up. They're always titrating upward, even until the patients are lightheaded. They are, they used to do that. But here, one arm you get to do it, crank it all the way up, the other arm half volume. So then I ask the students, design the trial for me, they always say, okay, if you had to do that control arm, I don't know why you would, but if you had to do it, 10,000 people, you randomize them, Secubitril, Valsartan, and Alapril, just like that. But then I said, you know what? They didn't do it that way. 
They did all this in the consort figure one. I look at this. They did all this stuff. What is this stuff? I'll make it simple for you. They took those 10,000 people with New York heart two, three, four heart failure, and they made them stop whatever ACE or ARB they were taking. You might have been taking lisinopril. I might have been taking valsartan. You might have been taking captopril, because you're, 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 you're always an odd mole. <laughs> and you stop what you're taking, and then you have to take an allopril, 10 milligrams BID, for 14 days. And in those first 14 days, 1,000 people discontinue the product. 1,000 people either throw in the towel, some people die, some people have failure. 1,000 people are off the study. All right, this is mile marker one in a marathon. We've already lost 10% of the population. Then there's the second run-in. You stop the enalapril. Now you take Secubitril Valsartan for 28 days, twice as long. The first 14 days, you take 80 milligrams BID of Valsartan, the half max dose. And then the next 14 days, you take 160 BID of Valsartan with the, with the Secubitril and another thousand people drop out of the study. So we've lost 20% of the study population. And then we randomize. We randomize the experimental arm gets to continue the same drug on Tuesday. They took Monday. They just keep taking Secubitril Valsartan and the control arm has to switch back to an Alapril 10 milligrams BID, a drug they hadn't taken last month. So what is a run-in period? A run-in period is often used in psychiatry where they run in people who are depressed on placebo, and if your depression gets better, they pull you out, then they randomize you to SSRI or placebo. Here, the run-in period is, what it's doing is, it's a type of inclusion criteria. You know, we say we want people over the age of 18, or we want people with GFR, you know, greater than 30. We want people who can survive a double drug run-in period of unequal periods of time with up titration of the new drug, but not the old drug. But in clinical practice, we don't have this inclusion criteria when we prescribe the medicine, so we're not really mimicking the trial. The longer you run in on the drug, the more you exclude people idiosyncratically intolerant to your product. So actually they favor their product because they have twice as long to run in on it. Imagine there's somebody who was taking an Alapril, 10 milligrams, BID, day 15 they were gonna throw in the towel. If they were taking the experimental drug, they could, an Alapril they couldn't because they'd be rolled into the next phase. All right, so this is, now I got a couple problems. Your control arm is not what we do, the drug is the drug is a super high dose, uh, double drug run in unequal periods of time. It's getting to be weird for me. I had this crazy thought popped into my head. You know, the package label was 10 milligrams BID. There must be somebody who was taking 20 BID. They joined my study. They got assigned to the control arm and now we cap their dose below what they were already getting. They could have tolerated more drug. Proof of that is they were taking more drug 15 minutes ago. No, actually 42 days ago, you know, <laughs> right? They were taking more drug. So then I said, can you estimate in this study, you know, studies always recruit people better than the average patient. How many people were actually taking a higher dose of enalapril? And if that number is substantive, it suggests that this arm is just handicapping patients on that arm. Like they're just being limited in what they can take. They're already taking a higher dose. So their outcomes are worse than what they would otherwise be. You know, it'd be kind of a pro, I would say it's an, even an ethical problem for the trial. But how am I to figure this out? It's there in the supplement. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and ARB doses at screening visit when they started. And it said the mean enalapril dose was 16. That's less than 20. But the standard deviation was 8.3. And 16 plus 8.3 is more than 20, which is 10 BID. So I did this which is I assume a normal distribution of enalapril dosing, and then I drop that cutoff at 20, which is the cap on the study. And using that mean and standard deviation, I say probably one in three patients was taking a higher dose of enalapril at baseline than this trial allowed them to take. This isn't average people. These are people who can take a truckload of ACE inhibition, and you're capping it in one arm, while in the ARB arm, you're driving it to the maximum dose. Okay, so I've, I think it's already a problem. I gave a version of this talk, and I posted it on the internet. And then somebody wrote back to me, they said, Dr. Prashad, you made a, you know, obviously, obviously I know you know this, but you know, you made a mistake, which is you've assumed that you can give 19 milligrams of enalapril, but it's a pill. It only comes in certain pill sizes. So you can't have a normal distribution. Obviously the distribution would look like this if you account for pill size. And the equation obviously is, is this little thing here, which, you know, I, I knew that, right? I mean, obviously, obviously I knew that, but, you know, it's this thing. And actually, apparently, there's more than one unique solution, but this is one of the unique solutions. Okay. Good point. 
Gabrielle Rogers. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> but his point was that it's about 15%, he thinks, we're taking more than 20 a day. And uh, I think that's probably right. I'm not arguing that everybody was taking more. I'm arguing a sizable fraction were taking more. So they were penalized by being put on the control arm. And the other argument I'd make to you is that in clinical practice, the doctor wasn't as aggressive in cranking up the dose as they would have been on the trial. So accounting for that, I would probably say one in four people could have taken a higher dose on the control arm. So their outcomes are going to be worse if you believe in Milpacker's data. And he should believe it because he's also the author of this study. Um, so these are the problems I see with the study. So the overall problems. Then the final problem I see that we don't talk enough about is the dose you actually prescribe of Entresto is not the studied dose. It's like a homeopathic dose. Nobody takes the dose that's in the trial. We don't have any data that the dose that we're giving is any better than just giving an ACE inhibitor and up titrating. The other thing is in this trial, if you're on the Entresto arm, you had a lower blood pressure, I think 2.4 millimeters mercury. Um, okay, so I guess my conclusion is I don't know Secubitril is a useful drug. I know that with a double drug run-in, that that experimental arm won. Oh, one more point. Because, you know, they don't switch on the experimental arm. This is another key point. Imagine lisinopril, valsartan, and, 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 and uh, uh, enalapril were all the same, but every time you switch, one in a thousand people have exacerbations, just from the switch, because they're not used to it. In this trial, the control arm pays that penalty, not the intervention arm. So that's yet another bias, okay. So this, this trial is just written in a way to favor one arm. Okay, so I asked Rosa Ahn, who was a medical student at OHSU. Did she overlap with you? No, younger than you. Younger than you, yeah. I asked her, go ahead and pull every cardiology approval in the last decade, 46. Pull all the trials, 141. How many were drugs A plus B versus placebo? Sorry, A plus B versus C. That's this trial. A plus B, Secubitril, Valsartan versus uh, and enalapril, enalapril, okay. How many were like that? And the answer is you typically get drug versus placebo, A versus B, AB versus A versus B, which is, these are kind of logical designs. Unknown was just because they didn't even report it, which is kind of a problem. Um, AB versus A. But there was only two that was A plus B versus C. Does anyone know the other one? You may know, heart man. <laughs> I think it was isosorbide hydralazine versus enalapril, which is a drug called Bidil, and it initially had uh, a signal. The whole, I think the overall trial was negative, but in the subgroup of people who were self-reported African-American, there was a signal. But then FDA made them do a follow-up study of A plus B versus placebo to kind of flesh that out. Um, so this is the drug Bidil. Um, but this was the only one that came to market as an individual trial with A plus B versus C. The next thing I asked her is, how many have run-in periods? How many don't? It's about maybe a third, a third, and a third didn't tell you. Um, and how many had a double drug run-in period of unequal periods of time? And the answer was zero. So we wrote in uh, circulation, we said, you know, for drugs like this, you need a confirmatory trial. Like, why do we do two trials in medicine? We don't do two trials because we want to put more zeros in the p-value, because the p-value is just telling you the probability you would have seen this result or more extreme, assuming the null is true. Assuming that you're just sampling from the same population, assuming there's no difference, assuming you're putting your hand in the same jar. But, so this tells you that that's extremely unlikely to be the case, that this is sampling from the same distribution. But nobody thinks that that is true. I'm 100% I'm sure they're doing differently, and that's not due to chance, but what I'm 0% sure is it has anything to do with Secubitril. I think it has everything to do with the run-in period and the dose. Nothing to do with Secubitril, in my opinion. So the purpose of the confirmatory study is to alter the preconditions a little bit and see if you get the same result. And since we did this paper, uh, we got Paragon, which is, ooh, missed that primary endpoint. We got Paradise, which is post-MI, and ooh, it, it didn't work there. Actually, it's the only drug I'm ever aware of that works in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but not post-MI. Everything works in both. And then there's life analysis, which is also negative. And then I saw somebody put this up. Paradigm, the endpoint was met. Paragon, negative. Paradise, not met. Life, not met. And Pioneer was met, but it was a pro BNP level. And so, no, oh, I cut it out. I'm missing a slide. Ah, oh, you see where we're going. All right, so what's my conclusion? My conclusion is not good. It's not good about, um, the trial's not good. The trial's not good because it was one study and it was heavily biased in favor of the product. And remember, I kept saying we have a lot of flozins. We have no other bitrills. What am I to think? 
If the vitriol class of drugs was such a game changer, and all these companies are in the business of vitriol making, why is there no other vitriol? But in Flozins, I think Flozins really work. Because every Flozin works. They all work the same. They all work so good. But the vitriols don't work, you know? And so I guess my conclusion is, well, I don't think it should be prescribed. I think it should be revoked from market. Uh, or they should just redo a paradigm. Redo a paradigm in people ACE intolerant and just do the same dose of Valsartan. Let's see how it shakes out. And they should do another trial which actually mimics what we do, which is we take people on ACEs and ARBs and we stop it and put them on Entresto instead. And we put them on a, whatever dose they can take, which has nothing to do with the dose tested in the trial. All right. So any questions on Entresto? All right. Well, yes. We, we pretty much use it exclusively. OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Actually, yeah. So the homeopathic dose that we yeah. usually up titrate patients yeah. on, like we, we switch them if they, like a lot of our ICU patients maybe came in on an, uh, an ACE and then they have this big MI and then we put them on Losartan and then with the, like we hope that we're going to put them on. And Tresto sometimes, Tresto. yeah. So who, how did like the cardiology team decide on this like baby dose that's now like everybody is just on that? Like, did they have another kind of review article in a, I guess I'd say, like, the, to my knowledge, these are all the randomized studies of the top, like the major randomized studies that measure clinical and even surrogate endpoints like Pioneer. How did this happen? Uh, since it is recorded, I'll omit some details, but I guess I would say that oh, in the... No, no. I can talk, we can talk, I can talk off, uh, top line, I'll tell you what I really think. But um, what happened was, the years after this product came out, the day this product came out, I wrote uh, like a, the same thing I'm telling you now. I wrote this and I sent it to some people and they posted it on a blog called, the, it's the New England Journal used to have a blog linked to their thing. And Mill Packer and I got in a big debate on this. I mean, we were arguing tooth and nail about it. And then in the years after, and it was read by lots, I and mean, back in the day, it was like the only thing you could read that was, you know, so was less content back then. There was no good uh, van life videos on YouTube, so people had to read this kind of stuff. Okay, so, <laughs> so then, so then the sales were zero. Like Novartis had very poor sales for this product for few, the first few years after market. And part of the problems were the dose is just so stiff. And so then somewhere along the way, people came up with the idea that people cannot tolerate the dose that's tested in the trial. So we're going to try to like administer much, much lower doses, which to my, my, what I would say is that, that the dose that we're giving is just not tested. Like for instance, you take somebody and they take whatever dose Losartan, uh, you know, let's say I can get them to the equivalent of like 80 Valsartan a day. And Tresto, what, am, what dose am I giving them? And is that actually better than what I could give them in ACE or ARB only? And the answer is nobody knows. There's just no data. And I was really recently talking to, I think, Greg Fonero from UCLA. And he actually acknowledged that he thinks this is a problem with all of the drugs that you call that goal-directed heart failure therapy, is that they have very limited data for the doses that are commonly prescribed. Um, but I think it's a big problem. The, now, but then since then, Novartis launched a very famous marketing campaign. There was a video where somebody was sitting in their living room in the water. I don't know if you saw this video. The water, they were like drowning in their living room. Um, and uh, then they started detailing doctors and then they added it to the American College of Cardiology level one, like category one level, level one evidence recommendation. And the moment it got that, then it started to snowball. So now sales are up. All right, so, and then offline I'll tell you. Yes? General question about running period. Yes, running. Is the point before randomization to see if Everyone can tolerate the drug? I think there's some philosophical disagreement on what the running period, like why it's there. In my opinion, I think trials should be pragmatic. They should be the way I practice in the clinic. In other words, don't exclude anybody if they're old or frail or have low GFR, if I'm, if I'm gonna be prescribing those drugs for older, frailer people. And it should just be like clinic where they come in as they are and they're randomized to stay on what they're doing or just switch to Entresto or something like that. And the doctors in both arms encouraged up titrate. Like that to me is like the perfect, this should change your practice randomized study. Now, one of the reasons people do run in, especially for, like, it started, I think, primarily in the psychiatric literature, is that we know with depression, a lot of people just get better with time. And so, and a lot of people get better with the power of suggestion. Like, you are taking a powerful new pill that might end your depression. You, it's, a, it's a non trivial number of people who get better. So, they want to do SS, they want to do all these depression studies. They, they thought they wouldn't be able to see the signal of what the drug is accomplishing if all these people are getting better in both arms spontaneously. So they take a thousand people, I don't know, I'm exaggerating the numbers, it's usually smaller. They take a thousand people, they run them in for two weeks, and all these people whose depression was quote unquote getting better, just out of the power of suggestion, they're excluded. And then they randomize them to SSRI or placebo. 
Okay. And then they try to prove typical follow-up is 8 to 12 weeks. We have SSRI literature very rarely follows people past 8 to 12 weeks, so we have no real data on the question of are you better off one year later, two years later. Um, but then they look at depression outcome scores then. Uh, there's another asterisk, which is that when you swallow an SSRI, some people have a metallic taste in the mouth. Some people have a dry mouth. Some people have a, you know, some other thing that lets them kind of get clued in that they're not taking a placebo. And some people say that that little thing is itself a placebo effect. Like you're, you, you're more likely to think your depression is getting better because you taste metal in your mouth. So what people suggest is there should be active placebo control. Not sugar, but like a little dash of Benadryl or a little dash of you know, metal so that it has the same taste. You know? And so hold that constant and then see what the effects are. And so there's a whole literature on active and passive placebos, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now the fun stuff. Let's see. Let's see how long Jeff lasts as chief now. <laughs> All right, I found this interesting. I think there's at least one teaching point here. The evidence on community masking has undergone a lot of a lot of shifts over the last year, and I think finally we're almost relinquished it. Although at at our hospital we still do it. We're still doing it. We do it another hundred years, but. We're almost done. So we all know the, I don't know if we all know the history, but the history was basically in uh, early March 2020, Fauci famously went on 60 Minutes. He was directly asked, should people in the community wear masks? And his answer was pretty much, uh, no, we don't think so. And we think, you know, you're going to be touching your face and maybe doing something compensatory. And, you know, we just don't have strong evidence to do that. Then in the subsequent eight weeks, um, led by a lot of prominent activists and a lot of op-eds, uh, there was a 100% flipping of this issue, and the new messaging was, yes, we should, but of course, we shouldn't use surgical or N95s in the community. Those will take it away from important healthcare workers. We should use cloth masks, make our own. There are lots of videos on how to make it, et cetera, et cetera. But what was the evidence at the time? And the evidence at the time, this is Cochrane's review in 2020 by Jefferson and colleagues. It was supposed to be published in January of 2020, but due to editorial delays, it was published eight months later which itself is something of a scandal, but anyone who took the time to read the literature would find that this was the answer. Quote, and this was why he said what he said in early March. Seven randomized controlled trials have taken place in the community and two studies specifically in healthcare workers. Compared to wearing no mask, wearing a mask may make little to no difference in how many people caught a flu-like illness. Nine studies, 3,500 3, people, and probably makes no difference in how many people have flu confirmed by laboratory test. Six studies, 3,000 people. Unwanted effects were rarely reported, but included discomfort, and then N95 masks. Four studies in healthcare workers, one small study in the community, compared with wearing medical surgical masks, respirators make little to no difference in how many people have confirmed flu, and make little, no, no, little to no difference in how many people catch a flu-like illness or respiratory illness. Discomfort was mentioned. So, I think the reason he said what he said was because he genuinely thought, when he went on in March, early March, that that was the right answer. That was the consensus of WHO, it was the consensus of Cochrane, Tom Jefferson had been on the review for, you know, since the early 2000s. Then what happened? A lot of articles like this, The Real Reason to Wear a Mask by Tufeki, who is a sociologist now at Columbia, Jeremy Howard, who's a professor of computer science, and Trish, who is Greenhall, who is the Oxford professor of evidence-based medicine. Research shows that even a cotton mask dramatically reduces the number of virus particles emitted from our mouths by as much as 99%. And she goes on to cite this study. Models show that if 80% of people wear masks that are 60% effective, easily achievable with cloth, we will get to an effective R0 of less than one, et cetera, et cetera. So it was based on you know, studies of mannequins that have spraying aerosol from the mouth and modeling studies. And I think at this point, uh, the verdict is in that the cloth does absolutely nothing. It never did anything, and it cannot possibly do anything. But the difference between the randomized study and the mechanistic studies is the difference between knowing a cancer drug inhibits cell growth in culture and whether or not people live longer when they swallow the pill. Because it is, it is a tiny portion of the process. Because mask working in real life has to do with your compliance, how well it fits, the fact you take breaks, what do you do when you don't do it, what are the compensatory behaviors, are you more likely to go out or go to the grocery store, do you have a false sense of protection or not? And randomization kind of catches all that stuff together in a way that mechanistic science doesn't. Then, because of advocates, they went down quite young. Quote, what I'm telling folks is that indoors, 
In sharing an air pocket, keep the mask on regardless of the distance. The topic of children transmission is unsettled, but I think K through 12 can mask up as they do in many countries, and it's okay if younger ones do it imperfectly. This is Tufeki, who became a uh, writer for the New York Times and had the big bully pulpit. And even though the World Health Organization said no one under the age of six should do it, the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics took it down to two. That was based on zero randomized control trials that I could see. And worse, the randomized data I thought was pretty negative. But worse to me was also the fact that the policy was they have to wear it. They have to wear it in the school, except when they take the nap in the same room sleeping next to each other for two hours. So I think even if you think it's bioplausible, that will undermine the plausibility. So we wrote in Slate of 2021, the noble lies of COVID-19. Do we want public health officials to report facts and uncertainties transparently, or do we want them to shape information to influence the public to take actions? And we revisit a couple of instances where we argued that it was a noble lie, but the noble lie wasn't, as Fauci pointed out, I lied to you initially so that you wouldn't deplete the hospital supply. I think the noble lie was the second one where he told you that the cloth would work because he knew it wouldn't, and that's what all the available evidence knew. But the reason he changed was there was a strong concerted movement by activists to change. Margaret McCartney, who's a GP in the British, in, in BMJ, she wrote in 2020, we need better evidence on non-drug interventions. She called for cluster randomized controlled trials. They were gonna run those in the UK, but those were actively thwarted again by the same activists. They opposed the study and they never ran. I wrote in 2021 early that research on masking kids is a pandemic failure that we have absolutely no evidence. There's a dearth of large empirical studies on benefits versus risk. And I will show you in the paper, I say, I also think there's a fallacy that, you know, that it has to be all or nothing. Uh, we launched zero RCTs in the US to test whether and what circumstances it helps. We'll talk about the one RCT that was launched, but the fallacy it had to be all or nothing. I suggested that it might matter cloth versus disposable surgical, the age of the child and executive function, indoors versus outdoors, rate of SARS-CoV-2 in the community, time of duration indoors, they may work for less than 15 minutes or two hours, but by eight hours, unlikely to, and cohorting. If the kids are in cohorts together, masking may be superfluous during normal length days. So all of these things could be studied in factorial design where you randomize all these parts of it. Okay, enter, I think, the only study that will be enduring from this, which was published in Science, the impact of community masking on COVID-19, the Abelux study. This was run not by, not, by, uh, uh, rec not, by, not by doctors. It was run by an economist. I and mean, he was very interested in economic interventions. He went to Bangladesh. He identified 600 villages. He matched the villages by population size. It had to be rural Bangladesh, not urban. Okay, And uh, he excluded the, the probability that you had had COVID before you entered the study was basically zero. These were villages that had not had COVID. This was run in, I think, second quarter of 2020. And uh, it's a 600,000 person, sorry, 300,000 person randomized control trial. I always look up trials on clinicaltrials.gov. It has four endpoints. Okay, number one endpoint, symptomatic SARS-CoV-2, which means everybody in this study, you're randomized to villages where we pull up with boxes and give out masks and villages where we consent you, but there's no masks being given and you're randomized to call us every time you have symptoms. That is, that is, oh, well, that's not the secondary endpoint. Uh, that's this, sorry, that's three. Call us if you have symptoms is three. Anytime you have self-reported symptoms of COVID-19, okay, you call us if you have symptoms. Then we send you a kit to draw your blood and if the blood test says your runny nose is due to COVID, you're in the primary endpoint, symptomatic SARS-CoV-2, okay? The secondary endpoint is how much they wore the mask, how proper they wore it. And then this is a really interesting endpoint that has never been reported to date, where they take random people in both villages and they draw their blood and they look for COVID. They have the blood, but they've never run the, this analysis. So this is a missing endpoint. And this was famously positive in the no mask villages, the cloth mask villages, of course, fails. This p-value is pretty much like, not, it's like the same point estimate, you know. But the surgical mask villages have an 11% reduction, p-value less than 0.05. So this is what Abelux says, you know, is, is the winner. Coming back to the interventions, cloth mask failed for the symptomatic endpoint. 
Surgical mask, he says, is a winner. We'll come to that. Infection rates has never been reported. These are the random rates. I actually think this is the best endpoint because it's the most bias resistant. Here, if I'm wearing a mask, I might be slightly more likely to call you or not call you. So like just telling me how many times you have fever, sore throat, scratchy throat, things like that, I say, I think this is a subjective endpoint and it's influenced by open label. Like you can't blind people to wearing a mask. They know they are. And so this endpoint has low credibility. This endpoint is a little bit better, but you can only qualify for this endpoint if you first come through the calling me. This endpoint is the best endpoint, the not yet reported one. And this endpoint, I mean, is interesting for intermediary stuff. Okay. The study took place at a time and place with zero natural immunity, zero vaccination. So does it apply to, this was only a few months ago here. <laughs> does it apply to outside in a city that's highly vaccinated and people have already had COVID? I don't know. All right, now I'll tell you the most interesting thing about the study. Concealment bias. Okay. They went to villages that are perfectly matched on population. Okay, they're matched. And you can see the number of people who consented in the treatment is 178,000. And the number of people who consented in the control arm is 163,000. And that's a difference. And if you plot it out, the consenting population size, this is something of a, of a Z estimate. This basically says, if we put our hand in the same jar and sample twice, how likely are we, how likely are we to see something? So if you put your hand in the same jar and sample twice, most of the times the symptomatic seropositive rate is, is the same, but sometimes it's much lower in the first handful and sometimes it's much lower in the second handful. Okay, that's, that's, this is basically most statistics. And this is the actual observed value in the paper. Okay, so it's like, you know, unusual, but not super unusual. The symptomatic rate calling me with symptoms is, this is the observed value and it's highly unusual. Like there's a bigger difference there. And this is the difference in the population that consent. It's actually the single most unusual. Look, there's the most zeros in the p-value. So why? Why in this paper did so many more people agree to be in the mask arm than the no mask arm? Any guess? And what is that called? So it's actually, in randomized studies, you always talk about blinding. Blinding means the patient doesn't know what they're getting. We talked about SSRI, I'm swallowing a pill. I don't know if it's placebo or drug. There's a second thing of randomization called concealment. Concealment means that when you were randomized, you didn't know which arm you were gonna go into. You didn't know that you were gonna be in the treatment or control. So you agreed to the study without knowing where you'll be. But if you know which arm you're going to go into, you might not consent at the same rate. If you know somebody's about to open a package and give you some free stuff, you might be slightly more likely to consent than the other arm. So you want to have concealment, meaning the participants don't know. But what this is telling you is there's something wrong at the concealment stage because many, many more people are signing up in one arm than the other arm. Okay, and it turns out there is a problem. When they do this trial, if you're in a control village, they pull up in a Toyota Yaris with a clipboard. Say, who wants to sign up for my study? In an intervention village, they pull up in a big pickup truck with boxes in the back. Who wants to sign up for my study? And they see their boxes in the back. So maybe I'm gonna get something. And actually probably 11 people out of every 10 people sign up in those villages. So now it's not really randomized actually. It's got a bias. And the bias is there's an extra person in the, in the treatment village that's not in the control arm villages. They signed up only in one village because they thought they were getting something, but they didn't sign up in the control villages. And then the question about a randomized trial is, is that person the same type of person? The type of person that enters a study only when they get something free, but not when they don't, is that the same as somebody who signs up for nothing? And I would argue that they're different. And it's a difference that matters because the type of person that only signs up when you get something free is much less likely to call that card when they got the sore throat and much less likely to mail back that little blood finger stick, blood thing, if they think they have COVID. And so, actually this paper, there's a paper by Ben Recht and colleagues from Berkeley where they say that just accounting for concealment bias, you can explain the entire thing, this difference, and that difference is, that's a bigger denominator. And so, you know, so it's actually kind of a negative study in my opinion. Okay, that's all for the controversial stuff. But why do I, oh, then the last thing, Cochrane came out with a new estimate, and of course they're back, the Jefferson 2023 review, right here, smack dab in the middle, 
no difference. I plotted it next to all the other negative Cochrane studies, and I just pulled the, the results. Ischemic preconditioning. We found no clear difference between the two groups. Skin care interventions. Skin care interventions probably do not change the risk of eczema. And then wearing masks makes little to no difference. Exercise intervention did not affect. And I guess the reason I show this is just to say, people say that the confidence interval is wide, and so we can't exclude some benefit. But this confidence interval is even wider. And they say it don't work. And so I guess I'm saying we just have to have some consistency in how we interpret studies. All right. Time is up. I have some stuff on vitamin E. I have some stuff on parachutes. I have some jokes, of course. Um, all right, we'll stop there, and we'll see what questions people have. Maybe I'll summarize the takeaway points. The takeaway points are, <clears throat> we can also talk about medical news and white flip-flops or parachutes. But I guess the takeaway points I view as uh, you, you have to have some way to keep up with the literature. You're never going to be able to read all the articles. You've got to pick and choose what you want to read. The second takeaway point is that when you do, do read an article, you really, there's a lot in there. And so reading one article a month or one every other month but doing a really deep dive will be much better for you in the long run than just superficially reading what people say. The majority of interpretations of studies that I read, that I hear people say, I really think are, I, I don't want to say majority, but a huge chunk I think are erroneous or wrong. Like that Bangladesh study, to really get to what I think the root issue was, you gotta, it's like a lot of levels, it's like an onion. By the, by the end of it, you're crying and you're not sure you want to be there in the first place, you know? <laughs> so it's really kind of a mess. Um, but I think that that's the interesting thing, and it's unfortunately the task that we have more and more. Because when I read the journals, they look more and more like advertisements, all the stuff that, you know, when you go to conferences, it's very polished presentations that are meant to advance products. And you know, at a place like this, you're prohibited from like, having a lot of these interactions, so you can get a more pure estimate of how things work. But I really think that you know, a lot of this falls on our shoulders. And uh, I think that there are lots of interesting things in these when you look at them pretty closely. But I will stop there. I'm happy to do questions. I'm happy to talk about why the medical news feels like this, that they spin a wheel, coffee can cause depression in twins. Uh, or we can call it a day. All right. Questions from the group at all? <clears throat> yes. Is it, I mean, I think it's really interesting. We've talked about the Intrusco study before, um, and it it always is just shocking to me that we have these like huge drugs that go through all this testing and regulation and all these things, but then like when you dissect it out in this presentation, you know, you're like, okay, should we really be pushing this one drug over these other things? And like all this money is made, and then you charge patients more for it and stuff. And I wonder if like you have any thoughts just on like if this is just an issue with where this is all headed. <coughs> this is like do you have thoughts on hmm. just from your like humble perspective of, of you know how you think uh, a solution to this this trend that we're seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess I think the question is basically like um, so many products are coming, and sometimes when you look at it, you feel a lot of uncertainty and yet we're kind of relentlessly encouraged to promote these products. I guess I have a few thoughts. One is, you know, I, I don't like quality metrics for that reason precisely. Like, I know people who are graded on, they get a bonus if 75% of women that practice get a mammogram. I was like, well, that's a preference sensitive decision. And there's also like a huge, it's like one of the most disputed interventions despite 40 years of practice. Who should get it, how often, what age to start? And yet you're incentivizing that. Why? Because you can count it. We have the new colonoscopy study, which is Nordic. Nordic is actually a null study. It didn't, have, it didn't reduce colon cancer death. Maybe it will with more follow-up. People say that it's like too low compliance, but there's, some, there's a more technical reason called instrumental variables where I don't think that's the answer. But um, that's another example. All the new drugs in oncology, they're coming to market with, we gave it to 40 people, and you know, 20, 20 did okay. I was like, well, what would happen if you did nothing to 40 people? And what would happen if you gave the standard of care to 40 people? Oh, well, we didn't have a control arm. You know? That's what we're confronted with. And so what do I think? I think... Sometimes those old sayings in medicine are always true. You know, you don't want to be the first doctor to do something, you don't want to be the last one. You know, that there's something about these new products, like we can have some skepticism. We have to read it carefully. Um, and I mean, this is more my job than any of yours, unless you choose it to be. But like, I'm like, I'm in the business of like, 
if it's really a problem, I gotta put out a video and a podcast and I've gotta do all this stuff to try to get people to see that this is an issue and write a paper and try to change the guideline and all those sorts of things. Um, but in your practice, coming back to what you have to do, I think the, th the hardest task of medicine is not to be distracted by all the shiny new pills, not to be distracted by all the stupid pop-ups in Epic that tell you to do something, and then just remember that the core goal of the interaction is this is somebody either coming to you uh, in a time of sickness, something bothers them, something concerns them, and your job is to do your best to try to make them feel better about it and not to forget that. I, so many times patients come in, my elbow hurts, next thing they know they're leaving with a PSA screen, a colonoscopy visit, you know, they're on Entresto, and then, but my elbow still hurts. You know, we didn't even address what they cared about. You know? And we have the same thing in oncology, just putting people on more and more drugs and, and I think in many cases being, um, omitting things by not telling them. Like telling, if you told somebody the real data, I'll just give you one example. I like to give this example. There's two treatments for lymphoma if it has this one mutation called MIC gene rearrangement. Okay, one is RCHOP. RCHOP has been the standard of care since like 76. It has had 20 people challenge it in randomized studies. Nobody ever beat it in overall survival. It's given in four hours. It has pretty good toxicity. It has a certain cure rate, works pretty well. Then there's EPOC, which is like an infusional drug. You either have to wear a pump or be hospitalized. Have you guys ever given EPOC here? Uh, okay. We, we don't do it. You don't do it in patient, okay. So it's like, it can be a week. And you know, I work at some hospitals where people are just said, oh, you need EPOC. And then you gotta come in every 21 days and get EPOC. And I always be like, I always want to know like, okay, well, what happens if you tell it to the person this way? Instead of you, and why do they do EPOC? They think EPOC is better. There's no randomized data that says it's better than CHOP. They just have two different studies that are apples and oranges, right? Okay, so I said, let me, put it to, let me put it a different way. What if you tell the patient this? You say, look, we got these two options. And historically, the first option had never been beaten in randomized fashion. We actually did do a study, EPOC versus CHOP, and uh, actually there was no benefit of EPOC, but it was in everybody. It wasn't just in people with your mutation. Some doctors believe that this is stronger, so it would be better, but we don't know that for sure. Like that's just speculation. We just don't know that to be true. Um, but the downside is you got to come all the way here and spend a week with us every three weeks for six cycles. And it's theoretically better, but I don't know that to be true. The other option is tried and true. It's not perfect. It has downside, you know, maybe, maybe it's inferior, but it's outpatient. You can come in, you know, what do you think? And every time they're like, I'm not coming in for a week if I, unless you, like, if you don't know for sure that it's better, why would I burden myself with that? And so I think to your question, the way you talk about it matters a lot. You know, if you give people all the information, all the uncertainty, a lot of people say, you know, it's not for me. And I respect that because if it were me, I wouldn't do EPOC. I mean, and I, you know, I'd give it, I will, but I wouldn't want to do it for me because I don't want to spend, a, have the pump and without proven benefit and knowing what I know that the pretest probability it's better has got to be low because you've tried 20 times to win and you never won. So that's kind of my bias of my thinking. Okay, yes. No, yes, uh, okay. Article read. Yes. Uh, do you have any suggestions for like discussions to look to or people to follow or yes. uh, ways to learn more? Let me see if I have it in my slides. But we're trying to help you. Okay, well, it's not it's an older slide deck. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. But, um, it's an older slide deck, so it doesn't have what I, what I wanted to share you. But um, okay, in oncology, well, but you're not gonna do oncology. Okay, who, where do you fall? So w we launched a subset called Sensible Medicine. Okay, Sensible Medicine is like five doctors writing like a medical magazine, but for like all doctors, that's the audience. It's on Substack. Um, and so we have like four articles a week. And Monday is How to Read an Article by John Mandrola, who's a cardiologist. It's mostly cardiology, but sometimes it's not. And I think is, he's like a super simple writer. He prides himself on writing very simply. And so I think that that's like a gem. Um, I think that soon we are gonna try to make a 10 part video series on how to read a paper. I've never told anyone this, but we're trying to make a 10 part series on how to make a video. I'm gonna try to put it on a different sub stack and like, I don't know, we're trying to figure out how we wanna do it, but it's gonna be like video one will cover the basics of studies. Um, I host this podcast called Plenary Session, and we've covered many, many of these trials. We do, for instance, when that Nordic study came out on colon cancer screening, we have three parts. We have one, I interviewed Brett, How Brett Hauser, who is the Nordic PI in Norway. Uh, two, I got a debate where some people really were adamantly pro-colonoscopy, 
and I'm, a, I'm pro flex sig, I'm not pro colonoscopy. Um, and so we had this fierce debate. That's on YouTube. I think that's good because you see people debate. But I feel like for me, what do I like to listen to? I like to listen to things I can do when I'm driving. I like to, so that's why I get YouTube premium so I can listen to the audio while I'm driving. So like if you put your phone down, it just keeps playing. Um, that's what I think are good. And then, you know, on, uh, I think a lot of people have blogs. It depends on how deep you want to go. If you wanted just something like fun to keep up with, I think I'd listen to like, Sensible Medicine has its own podcast. We put out one a week. I think it's good about critical appraisal. And so I think that's a good starting point. Yes. Um, as an internist, uh, who's like the quarterback of care, especially in the hospital when you're dealing with multiple subspecialties, what, what outcome should we care about? Like obviously it's the one that matters to patients, sure, but it can be very confusing and when you're dealing with a cardiologist, a nephrologist, a oncologist, and trying to figure out what, what do I care about? And, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a tough, that's always a tough question that I'm confronted because I'm called as a one consultant and I wonder what they're doing. So sometimes I feel like um, uh, sometimes I feel like cardiology is doing their best and they're operating really well, but they don't know the prognosis of the cancer. And if they did, they wouldn't be doing all that stuff, you know? Because I'm like, you don't need to be doing this. You're thinking about like three, five year time horizons. We're talking about like six month time horizons, you know? So that's one thing. So I feel like one thing the internist can do is pin down from the teams you know, what is the prognosis of this condition, that condition, what do you think this person's prognosis is? And then you have that information and when you hear discrepancies, you can tell one of them like, hey, listen, you, you're, I think you need to talk to cardiology because you're under the wrong impression about the state of the amyloid or whatever, vice versa. I think my bias is I feel like um, it's good to find consultants you can trust. And sometimes like, I think when you're an internist who practices and you practice for a while in the same place, you'll find that even better than calling an ID consult is have that one ID doctor you know and text him later or call him in the evening because it's somebody you trust and you like their judgment. And then based on what they say, you can decide whether or not to call the consult formally or not. But I find that to be really helpful. My phone is a Rolodex of people with like every, you know, in oncology, we have somebody like every specialty that I like to bug and I pick my people wisely. I pick them based on, do they say what, like, do they generally have a good philosophy? Um, and are they available at 24 seven? <laughs> do they write back very quickly? Because if you write back to me a day later, this is lost. I need somebody who can get back to me right away. So I, I cultivate those relationships. I think that's helpful. Um, it might even be the most helpful thing because to this day, that's what I think I rely on those networks a lot. Um, I always say we always do a lot as like, especially with the hospitalists to have the, the family meeting. But sometimes I think like just getting all the teams to meet together is super valuable. Um, when I round, I always tell the fellow that after we see all the patients, we just go to every single team room and talk to the teams because it's so much, I mean, you learn, first of all, that you'll learn more information that wasn't in, apparent in the chart. You'll hear that, you know, so-and-so knows something you don't know. And then you talk to them face-to-face -face and try to explain not just like what we're, like what our recommendation is, but wh how we came to it. Um, the other thing I like to do is I always like to look at imaging in radiology. I know some of these things are time consuming, but you go in and sometimes it's a whole different story. Like the way the chart reads the imaging result and you go down and it's like, oh, you know what? Even though we call this as acute PA, it's like, it's really chronic. Like, you know, I mean, we're just being safe, you know? And so then you're, you're thinking a little bit differently, I think. Those, I think, are my like practical tips. It's a really good question. And I guess it's going to sound crazy, but I think like, mm, like reviewing articles is something that it's, it's like lifting weights. Like you, you'd be able to do more than you can do today if you just keep lifting heavier. I mean, it really is that way. So like when you start, if you really had this, like, yeah, I don't know, at some point you're going to set, it doesn't have to be tomorrow, it could be someday. You can start and you'll be like, okay, I'm just going to pick one journal and just start checking this. 
and then I'm gonna read a little bit. And then your own curiosity will get you. Every once in a while, there'll be some article, you're like, I saw this person said this on the internet, I saw this, let me try to figure this out. Let me think about it, let me ask somebody I know who I respect. And you're gonna start to get a little bit interested in it. And you're gonna learn a lot of things along the way that people don't teach you explicitly. Like, I don't know, what is a stopping rule? How do they know how to stop these studies? Why, uh, in the original Pfizer vaccine trial, there's all this debate about they changed the number of events before they stopped and that changed when the trial was halted. Was that logical and justified or was it illogical and unjustified? That's like a debate. But you wouldn't even know that debate until you like start to follow what people are saying on social media or on, you know, in blog posts and stuff. Okay, and then once you get there, that reading will be quicker to you. You'll know a lot more and so it'll be like, oh, you know, I know all the studies in this space. I know how this fits in quicker. Um, I, I see the same problems in studies all the time and I see this has that problem. Then I feel like, then you expand from one journal to, you're gonna look at a couple. And you mentioned a good one. The American Academy of Family Practice, AAFP. I think they make a very good journal. The reviews are very high quality. They're uh, like flow charts on how do you treat. And then they're like for like very, Think like the person is dizzy. How do I handle handle that? Or the person is you know the person is feeling depressed. How do I handle it? Like very common things, but very nice. They never have financial conflicts of interest in that journal. I, the editors of that journal are very good. Um, so that's another one. And sometimes Mayo Clinic has some really good ones on like how I take care of you know the shoulder, the hip, or something like that. So I feel like you will add to your portfolio of like what you keep an eye on. Um, you can use the journal alerts. You can use like Twitter if you follow the accounts. Uh, you can use, um, just go to the website. That's how I usually do it. I just search on my phone. I have a mobile bookmark, so I just click through real quick when I'm at the elevator. Awesome. Any last questions? So, um, well, I should say thank you so much for coming. Yeah, to thank you. And, and uh, yeah, I think this is something that comes up. And even if there's controversies around topics, the goal really is like you as a physician, a big part of your education is how to think. Uh, especially because you picked internal medicine, which is a thinking specialty. And this is a big part of kind of no matter what you do and what clinical decisions come across your desk, kind of how you can kind of approach this for yourself going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Friend Jeffrey. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>